This evening is from the book of First Peter, the book of First Peter, and we're going to read some verses from chapter one uh, at the beginning, and then uh, some verses from chapter two. <clears throat> First Peter uh, chapter 1, uh, and this informs us who's, who's writing the letter and who the letter's to, and the, the greeting that accompanies it, and then some of the blessings that these people have received. First Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Those are regions in modern-day Turkey. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And then coming into chapter 2, verse 1. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honour is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. So we'll read turn with God's me again to, to 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> the title of the sermon this evening is Living Stones. The Living Stones. <clears throat> and that title comes from two words that are found in our text. And the text is one verse from 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, it's verse 5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now these two words, <clears throat> living stones, is a reference to men and to women and to young people and children who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ. Now, there are many pictures of the Church in the New Testament. Sometimes the Church is described as a vine with many branches tended by one vine dresser. Sometimes the Church is depicted as 
a flock, a flock with many sheep, looked after by one shepherd. Sometimes the picture is a holy city with many citizens, ruled over by a great king. On other occasions, the church is seen as a mighty army with many soldiers, but only one commander-in-chief. Now, as we come to our text this evening, we see in 1 Peter 2, verse 5, that the church here is described as a spiritual house, a great temple, having a chief cornerstone. And if you link it with verse 5, or verse 4, the previous verse, we read, as you come to him, to Jesus Christ, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so this evening we will concentrate on the picture of the church as a spiritual house that is presented to us in this fifth verse. And first of all, the transformation that is effected the transformation that is effected. You yourselves like living stones. Now in Peter's day, houses were not built with bricks. Most of them were built with stones. In fact, the house I grew up in was built by my grandfather uh, about 1900 with stones. Uh, Cartloads were brought from the quarry to build the stone. So uh, stone building goes back a long way and, and you still see people putting at least stone cladding on their houses. Now, of course, uh, that would mean for the builder many trips to the quarry for stones. There he would gather up a huge quantity to have sufficient to build the house. So it was these kind of stones that Peter had in mind in the text. Stones of different shapes and sizes each one carefully chosen to serve a particular purpose, a particular function in the building that was going to be erected, possibly needing to be shaped or refined before being put into place. <clears throat> but notice Peter calls these stones living stones. Living stones. Now you look at a stone, and I think you'll agree with me that there is nothing as cold or as dead, or as lifeless as a stone. And that is what the Bible says about people who are not believers, about people who are not Christians. They have a heart of stone. They are cold and unresponsive to God. They are dead in trespasses and in sins. But Jesus Christ came into the world to bring life to that which is dead. And we see that in, in many texts, John 20, verse 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name, spiritual life. So the person who becomes a Christian is transformed from being a stone into a living stone. As Jesus puts it in John 5, 25, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. A transformation has been effected. A great change has taken place. So when Peter compares Christians to stones, yes, he has in mind those rough-hewn stones used in the erection of a building. But he has to qualify this picture by calling these stones living stones. For a transformation has taken place. Peter's writing to people who have been made alive to God through their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. So how is it with you this evening? Are you like those rough-hewn stones lying around a building site with no life in them? Or have you been made alive to God? by the grace of Jesus Christ, so that you're now a living stone. If you're not a Christian, you probably find Christians difficult to understand. 
From your point of view, you find it difficult to understand why, why Christian people are so energetic about the things of God, why they delight to come to church, why the reading and preaching of God's word is so very important to them, why they love Jesus Christ and are thoroughly appalled and disgusted when the name of Jesus Christ is held up for ridicule and his person is denigrated and despised in our 21st century world. But the explanation is they are alive to God. They've had a spiritual transplant. They have a spiritual appetite. For non-believers, the opposite is true. They are dead in their sins. They are unresponsive to his word. They are even hostile to God. They even find the preaching of God's word like this, boring. Well, if that is your condition, you need to be born again by the grace of God. You need to, be, you need to become alive to God. You need to become a living stone the transformation that is effected. Secondly, the integration that is essential. The integration that is essential. Having described Christians as living stones, Peter goes on to write, they are being built up as a spiritual house. They are being built up as a spiritual house. Peter's thinking here, if a local fellowship of God's people, the local church, just like this church on the Sligo Road. As we see, and so we see that the scripture teaches us that when a person is saved, when a person is born again, when a person is converted to Christianity, when a person becomes a living stone, then that person must become integrated into the spiritual house. That person then must become integrated into the life of the local church. That is the integration that is required. I remember some time ago reading a book called Stop Dating the Church. It was challenging Christians to make a commitment to the church, to become members of a particular congregation. Now, a thousand bricks lying around on the building site have little value. No one doubts that they are bricks, but their potential is not realized until they are cemented together with other bricks. Then they serve a purpose, being built into something that can give protection and comfort or, or, or storage or a place in which work is carried out, a factory. And the same applies to Christians. The same applies to living stones made alive to God in Jesus Christ. They are to become part of a spiritual edifice. They are to become part of the church. Not made alive to Christ to operate independently of, of the church in, in some kind of freelance capacity. But made alive to Christ to take part with others in the fellowship of the church. The, the New Testament knows nothing of what I might describe as lone ranger Christians, Christians operating on their own. In the New Testament, the, the sequence is very clear. Acts 2, 47, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. People were being saved and they were added. They were joined onto the church. Those who were being saved were not left on the outside to view the church from a distance. No, they were added to their number, added to the church. First step, conversion to Christianity. Second step, integration into the life and fellowship of the church. A Spartan king once boasted to a visiting monarch about the walls of Sparta. And the visiting monarch looking around, was very confused because he could see no walls. His curiosity was aroused and he turned to the Spartan king and inquired, where are these walls of which you speak and boast so much about? 
The Spartan king pointed to his bodyguard of magnificent Spartan troops. There, he said, are the walls of Sparta, of every man of them a brick. There are the walls of Sparta, and every man of them a brick. You are living stones. Now, we're living in an age of individualism. <clears throat> there, this is the attitude of many in uh, century 21. Not only is this affecting the unity of the family, but it's also affecting the attitude of some Christians with respect to the church. Rather than seeking to become a part of a congregation, many Christians just want to do their own thing. They just want to act independent of any oversight or authority. Rather than offering their gifts and talents to be used through the church, they are dissipating their spiritual energies in all kinds of directions. In his book, Total Christianity, uh, the author Frank Cahoon writes, as far as the New Testament is concerned, there is no such thing as churchless Christianity. The church is not a burdensome appendage to the Christian religion. It is the Christian religion in its organized form and its outward organization. So if you are a believer, then you should seek to identify completely with this local church. You should seek to play an active part in its life and ministry and outreach. A brick that is not fulfilling its purpose weakens the whole structure, weakens the entire building. A Christian who does not become involved, who does not support his local church, weakens the entire body of believers. At this point, the devil uh, will come along with his deceitful scheming. He will subtly suggest to you that you're not really important in the life of the church. You're either too young, or you're too old, or you're too shy, or you have too much work to do. But you must resist the evil one. You must stand up to Satan. You must not permit it. Permit him to render you useless and ineffective. For be assured of this, if you are a Christian, not only are you important in God's scheme of things, but you're overwhelmingly important to concur with Satan's suggestion that you're unimportant is on the verge of blasphemy. You're one of the people for whom Christ came into the world to shed his precious blood. You're one of the people for whom Christ came into the world to save. You were bought with a price. You are therefore obligated to glorify God, to honor God with your entire being. And the way to do that is to serve him through the church. So what kind of brick are you? lying useless at the edge of the building, prepared to exist on the fringe of the church, or a brick well integrated into the building, actively involved in the structure and life and work and witness of the congregation. So make a fresh commitment this evening. Get involved. Get involved in the prayer life of the church, for example. or Get involved in the fellowship of the church or get involved in the evangelistic outreach of the church. And it is as you get involved, then you will increasingly share in the blessing that comes through serving Christ in this way. <clears throat> the transformation that is effected, the integration that is essential, and then thirdly and finally, the purpose that is explained. The purpose that is explained. <clears throat> Living stones... Yes, that is the transformation, the transformation that is essential. That's the vital first step. Being built into a spiritual house, being integrated into the life and fellowship of the church, that is the second step. But the progression doesn't stop there. The church exists for a purpose. Verse 5. <coughs> 
reading the, the entire verse. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be. To be a holy priesthood. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, in the Old Testament, sacrifices were a central part of the worship. And especially appointed people called priests were chosen to offer these sacrifices on behalf of the people. But since the death of Christ, since the offering up of that one sacrifice upon the cross at Calvary, no such animal sacrifices are now necessary. And so no such priests are required. Jesus Christ, our great high priest, as I've said, has offered up himself a sacrifice once for all. In him, in Jesus Christ, now every Christian is a priest. That was one of the great truths discovered at the Protestant Reformation and is described as the priesthood of all believers. As priests, we don't need to go through an earthly priest. Rather, we come directly to God through Jesus Christ. <coughs> and as priests, it is our privilege and our responsibility to offer to God sacrifices. Not sacrifices of bulls or, or goats or sheep mm. or, or doves or any such thing, but spiritual sacrifices. And what might these include? Well, the Bible uh, gives us several examples. There's the sacrifice of giving. Paul refers to the gifts of the Philippian Christians, describing them in Philippians 4 verse 18 as a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And so we are to give according to God's directions. We are to give purposefully to the work of the church. We're to give proportionately according to our means. And we're to give cheerfully with a glad and thankful heart. Remember, this is a sacrifice that is well-pleasing to God. Then there's the sacrifice of sharing. Described in Hebrews 13, verse 16. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And linked with this in verse 9, we see uh, again how we can share not only the physical things that we have, but the spiritual things that God has given to us as well. Uh, verse 9, but you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so we are to share Jesus Christ with, with others who are still in darkness, who don't know the abundance of the blessing that is to be enjoyed through trusting in him as our Savior. And then there's the sacrifice of praise. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. And in our singing tonight, that's what we've been doing. We've been offering up a sacrifice of praise, not, not for ourselves, but for God. We've been adoring him, offering up praise that the Bible tells us is acceptable to him, a pleasing aroma uh, to, to him. And then the sacrifice of self, Romans 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And so we are to offer all, all our gifts and all our abilities on God's altar for him to use as he sees fit. Christ, then, must be given first place in our lives. And his rightful place in our lives as we seek to serve him with all our gifts through the church of which he is the king and head. Now we are, uh, we are living in a selfish society where predominantly self is the motivating factor in the decisions uh, people make. How will this affect me? How, how will this alter my prospects? 
how will this affect my time? And so people's life orientates around themselves, but, but that is not to be the case. We are to present our lives, our talents, our energies to Jesus Christ as a living sacrifice for him to use as he, see fit, as he sees fit. Like Daniel, we must dare to be different. As members of Christ's body here on earth, so that in all things he might have the preeminence. So that the whole earth may be filled with the glory of the Lord. So what a picture of the church we've been given this evening. Made up of people transformed by God's grace. Not dead, cold, lifeless things like stones, but living stones transformed by the grace of Christ. Made up of people integrated into the life and work and ministry and fabric of the local church. And then thirdly, made up of people offering spiritual sacrifices to God, laying their lives on the altar in service to Jesus Christ. Make sure by God's grace that that's an apt description of your life as you have committed it to Jesus Christ. Amen.